Welcome to the abbreviated version of the science behind multilayer zirconia and speed centering of zirconia. Okay, uh, my name is my name is Paul Cascone, and I'm uh, in charge of R and D for the Arden Corporation. Uh, not in charge of audiovisual. So anyway, okay. So let's get started. <clears throat> so what we're going to do uh, is talk about the science behind multilayer zirconia. Uh, we're going to review the nature of dental zirconia just to get a background into understanding what we what we need to do for, in order to get multilayer. And again, describe the different types of zirconia. Again, something necessary in order to uh, uh, talk about multilayer. And then review the methods used to uh, uh, color zirconia. And then we're going to compare uh, multilayer zirconia brands. Now, I'm going to go through the first part uh, a little fast because we're a little short on time. And... Most of you have already seen some of this uh, information on, on that on that portion of it. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about the science behind speed centering of zirconia. Uh, we're gonna review the centering process. What do we accomplish during the centering process? And the impact of the furnace design on centering. And this is very critical. Uh, the, the furnace that you're using uh, is the, is uh, determines whether or not you can do speed centering. And now furnaces are coming on the marketplace that allow you to do uh, uh, speed centering. Okay, so uh, everyone knows that zir zirconia comes from uh, zircon, and uh, zircon uh, is uh, mined in uh, Western Australia, and that's a picture of the mine in the upper left, and that's what the powder looks like, uh, uh, or the granules look like on, on, the lower, on the lower left. And the formulation is very simple. It's uh, zirconium silicate, uh, it does have radioactive materials in there, so we have to uh, remove those, as well as the other, uh, 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 some contaminants. Yeah. Now, processing zirconia sand is very aggressive. You have to put it into hydrochloric acid, and uh, we're forming a zirconia chlorate. That's the underlying portion that you're seeing on the left of, of, the, uh, of the equation. And the particles of zirconia are very, very small. They're all nano, uh, they're all nano size. And this process, what happens to this feedstock uh, uh, when it goes to the different companies for fabrication uh, is de de determines what the final product is gonna look like. Uh, zirconia is very different than the uh, other materials that uh, we're used to seeing, like alloys and porcelain or alloys in porcelain, if you want to change the properties of the alloy or porcelain, you have to change the composition. With zirconia, you, you, you have one item to change, and that right now is uh, yttria. And uh, in order to modify that, you also have to change the processing. So zirconia is very dependent on processing. If you, uh, you could have the same composition from two different uh, manufacturers, and they're going to look, and they could look very, very different uh, because they processed it differently. And the process starts with the feedstock all the way back into the chemical, and then with the uh, mixing of the materials, the type of coloring oxides that are used, the nature of the coloring oxides, and then finally the disc fabrication itself. So for uh, uh, the zirconia, the compositions are very, very simple. 99% uh, of it is zirconia, a little bit of hafnia, which, which uh, you may remember is a sister element that you can't remove 100% out of zirconia, and then the yttria. That makes up over 99% of the formulation. When we add coloring oxides to it, that still makes up 99% of the formulation because the coloring oxides are less than a half a percent, They're certainly less than, than, than 1%. There are very, very small transition elements like iron or erbium uh, or manganese or cobalt, uh, but they, they get locked into the, into the lattice structure when they form a color. Now, we, the evolution of, uh, of zirconia has, has changed the, uh, the type of zirconia and how we use the zirconia dramatically. Uh, we remember back uh, uh, in 2004 when zircon was introduced, uh, we needed to put porcelain over it in order to make it look like a, a dental prosthetic. Now, that material was very strong, but that material was also uh, fairly opacious. Uh, translucency was only 30%. And then the 
uh, full contour zirconia and monolithic zirconia came into the marketplace around 2009. And those had a little less strength, uh, but they might had a higher translucency. And at 40%, you can make a crown that looks like a, looks like a, looks like a dental restoration. And then as time went on, uh, we, we first uh, saw the uh, introduction of the uh, anterior type materials. And those had a much lower strength, but they had a fantastic translucency. And over the years, what we've been trying to do is increase the strength of the material and increase the translucency. And uh, as you can see, we accomplished some of that with the HT Plus and uh, HT Plus ML, our multi-layer. Now we're going to see more types of zirconia in the coming years, and we have to learn how to use uh, use them uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, modify whatever we need to in order to accommodate the uh, chemical nature of the materials. And we're going to see some some new materials coming out in a, in a few years. Okay. Now, just as a reminder, uh, the Y classification of zirconia, the Y just stands for yttria, and the Y just indicates the percentage of uh, yttria that's in there. So uh, the original materials, uh, like the Ultra, the Zircon, uh, or Bruxer, or Nexera, they were all uh, about 5.5% yttria, and an abbreviated way of saying that is 3 mole percent, or, or 3 Y. Okay. Uh, in the case of the HT Plus, those are 4Y materials, just a little higher amount of the yttria. And then, of course, for the interior and the uh, Katana STML and RSTML, uh, we're talking about 5Y material. Again, that's a higher amount of yttria content. Now, for ceramics, we can't duplicate the weight percent every time. So uh, uh, ceramic engineers use a mole percent as an abbreviated form. But as you see in, in the... Uh, uh, in the advertisements for these materials, uh, a lot more, a lot of companies are talking about now 3Y, 4Y, and 5Y. Now, when we first started with zirconia, it was a white material. The first monolithic was a white material, and you needed to use coloring liquids in order to uh, uh, make it look like a dental restoration. Uh, that gave you a lot of control. However, the results were somewhat inconsistent because the results were very dependent upon the practitioner, and also depending upon how it was how it was used. Okay. Uh, then we saw the introduction of appreciated material. Now you had a consistent shade. Um, it may need a little more staining, and and it it, it wasn't a uh, hundred uh, percent transitional. Uh, you had to fake it with uh, some ad additional uh, uh, stains on the, on the surface of the material. Now with multi-layer uh, zirconia, th this gives you an automatic transitional effect. Uh, so not only are we are we reducing the uh, 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 the inconsistency of the results going from coloring liquids appreciated to multi-layer, but we're also reducing the amount of labor needed in order to achieve those results, and that's very important because with multi-layer, the goal is of course to, to just uh, glaze and go basically. Uh, the, the issues with it, uh, nesting is critical, as we're going to talk about, and uh, the inventory cost is a little more, but it more than offsets the, uh, uh, the, the, the decreased labor cost and the consistency of the units is the most important thing. Okay. So uh, some difficult cases still require the, uh, uh, the dipping, and this certainly is a difficult case. The doctor wanted two different uh, uh, shades on, on the same crown. Uh, for the appreciated, uh, appreciated was was a was a godsend when it when it first came out uh, because yeah, as you can see here we have a uh, we have two pontics and two abutments and a very thin abutment on on, on the uh, uh, on the right uh, and you still get the same shade and of course with the coloring liquids uh, we had a problem with the pontics not uh, absorbing too much coloring liquids and becoming dark. Now we're going to compare some uh, appreciated to uh, the multi-layer. Now we think very highly of our HD Plus appreciated, uh, but we think even more highly of our of our multi-layer. So the appreciated is on the left, and the multi-layer is on the right. And you can see in the middle section, uh, it's the same shade, and that's of course what we're what we're aiming for. However, the multi-layer uh, gives you an automatic transitional effect. 
Uh, we have extra layers in there, uh, and uh, we go from a uh, from a dark uh, a dark chroma uh, 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 gingiva down to uh, a, a nice uh, translucent incisal. And I'm going to show you a couple of shades. Uh, B2, for example. Now we can see it with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the shade guide. Uh, and again, you, you see the multi-layer has more chroma on the on the gingival and more translucency on the incisal. Uh, you get a little darker shade, and and again, that that effect comes really out very well. Uh, and and that uh, depreciated what was touched up with. Uh, uh, with with liquid in order to uh, mimic the translucency, but it doesn't compare to the to, to the multi-layer. Uh, B1 again the same way, uh, and again you can see the variation in the in the chroma and also the translucency and the match to the shade guide is much better. Okay. Uh, even B3 uh, and C4 very dark shades. And now you can see that uh, when you do get into a dark shade, now the uh, uh, the, the, the chroma and the and the gingiva really comes out uh, much closer to the to the shade guide than you could with a with a single pre shaded blend. Uh, D2 is a very difficult shade, as you know, uh, because the D2 neck has so much chroma to it. But yet on the on the multi layer, we're able to duplicate that. Uh, so we were able to pick up uh, nuances of the shade guide uh, very closely with the multi-layer. And of course, having the dye is very important when you're judging when you're judging shade. Okay. Now, uh, different companies have taken different approaches to putting together the multi-layer zirconia, and we're going to talk about uh, Katana. We're going to talk about Ivoclar, and then. Uh, our, our own approach to it. Okay, so for the katana, uh, as you know, they started uh, multi-layer, and um, uh, they just, uh, they uh, established a four-layer structure. Uh, the enamel layer is 35% of the disc, and then you have two transition layers that are kind of small, 15% each, and then the uh, body layer, which is another 35%. Now, this material was a nice material when it first came out at, at uh, 1100 megapascals. It did have a low translucency, um, so shades were a little difficult. Uh, but yet, as a multi-layer, uh, as, as a start for multi-layer, it, it looked pretty nice. Now, the most recent one that was introduced that's a little different is uh, Ivoclar Prime because they not only changed the layer structure, but they also changed the uh, composition of the layer structure uh, with different yttria contents. So th their approach though was a little unusual because the top three millimeters uh, of the incisal is, is 5Y uh, zirconia, that's the, that's the super translucent zirconia, but the three millimeters is independent of the disc size. Which is which is a little confusing to us. Uh, only the dentin uh, changes in thickness as the disc size changes. So you have the material on top being the weakest material, and that's the one that's going to get impacted the most. And then you have a three Y uh, zirconia, which is which could be a little opacious at times. Um, because it doesn't have the translucency of a four Y, um, but this is how they how they put their how they put their disc together. And you know, I have two questions: uh, uh, Why sacrifice the strength of the incisal layer? Um, I, I I didn't understand that. And also, uh, since the three millimeters is fixed independent of the disc size, how do you nest long span bridges? Uh, long span bridges are curved. And uh, you actually have a have a have a problem uh, with a curved bridge in a, in a disc of this type of construction. So uh, what's the what's the basis be, behind this idea? Well, the basis was okay. The three wires in the connectors, and that's where I need my strength. And 
okay, so I look at a bridge, and when a bridge goes into function, yes, the the occlusal surface goes into compression, which is good. Ceramics are very strong in compression, uh, even the 5 watt. And the 3 watt goes into tension. So, yeah, the, my stronger material is the one that's going to handle the tension. So when you talk about a, a, a bridge, that, that seems to work. That, that seems to work okay. However, um, uh, let's see what the computer says. And, and the computer agrees with that. The computer shows that the uh, stress concentration, uh, we're looking at a, a finite element analysis of a, of a, of a four-unit bridge. This case is on implants, but, but for what, I, what I'm talking about, it doesn't matter uh, whether they're abutments or implants. Um, stress concentration is going to be at the connector. And, um, and yeah, you get the same type of, uh, of uh, stress distribution. Uh, the occlusal surface goes into compression, which, again, is good. And the uh, intaglia surface goes into uh, tension, and again, that's where your that's where your uh, three wide material is, your stronger material is. So, so that seems to work fine. However, uh, we don't see a lot of fractures on bridges like that, <laughs> and that's because, uh, like our friends at Glidewell showed many many years ago. Uh, the bridge connectors, the height of the bridge connectors is extremely important. And the, the larger the height is, the, the, the better and the stronger the, the, uh, that bridge is going to be. So this we don't, conference we don't will now be recorded. We don't, we don't see that type of, um, uh, we don't see that type of uh, fracture uh, due to stress. What we see are these types of fractures, and these fractures are due to uh, someone trying to open up the embrasures with a hard diamond disc. And uh, uh, when, when that happens, the disc actually leaves a very uh, clear fingerprint. So it's obvious uh, uh, to us when, when, that, when that has occurred. So it, 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 uh, it, it's the type of failure that we see on connectors, we, we don't see a mechanical failure. What we see a mechanical failure on is are the molars and premolars, um, and and you know what, one one reason for that is that well okay the biting force uh, are, is the highest in the mouth in the molars and premolar area, uh, so the design of the restoration comes into play. Um, notice that the biting force on the anterior portion is very very low. And when we look at the stress distribution of, a, of an incisor, for example, uh, we, we exactly see that. It's a very low. All stresses are below 400 megapascals, which is why the Emax works so, uh, so well uh, for, for these applications. Uh, but the, the incisor itself does not present uh, too much of a problem for, for zirconia, uh, the design. It stood... It's the molars that present a problem, and the reason for that is, is primary is twofold. Number one, the occlusal fossa is a natural stress riser uh, that will always produce a stress, and 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 we could look at what type of stress. And when you do a finite element analysis on a molar that goes into function, what you find, as opposed to a bridge connector, the molar. Uh, and the area of the fossa actually generates tensile forces around that fossa. And you can see the little arrows going to the left and the right on the, on the cusp. It, it's actually literally pulling it apart. So for the Ivoclar prime material, the 5Y is in that area. And again, the, the question is, why put the, why put the weakest part of the material in the, in the area that's going to take the, 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 the majority of the stress? And, and in this case, for our units that we know fail the most, uh, this application is, uh, is somewhat questionable, putting a, a 5Y on top of a, a 3Y. Now, uh, this was uh, also demonstrated in a in a recent thesis that was done just last year. Uh, some of this work has not been published yet, uh, and uh, they looked at three Y, four Y, 
and then the the prime three y uh, five, five five y on top of three y, and then another combination with five y on top of four y, and and they developed a system where they uh, uh, looked at the fracture resistance, and they also looked at trying to age the material. That that, that is uh, putting it under a lot of load, um, uh, either by temperature or by or, or by mechanical force, and they developed this little device for, to do that. And, and what they found was these materials don't age. It doesn't make any difference what the, what the formulation is. The uh, the zirconia does not react to aging like the like the old um, uh, uh, orthopedic reaction uh, uh, the the orthopedic uh, system did. And what you can see here is that the four Y and the three Y are about they're very close in in numbers. But when you get to the five Y over the three Y the fracture resistance drops substantially, it drops by about a third. And and the four Y and five Y didn't didn't change that very much. As a matter of fact, it gave the same result. So so if this questions uh the the long term viability of having a five Y on top of a three Y uh system. And uh it has to do with how it was done. Um, and uh, we, we may see other materials come out that are that, that seem similar, but yet they're they're done a little differently, so that the fracture resistance does not decrease. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Christensen talked about uh, inadequate tooth preparations, and that's nothing new for the dental industry. Um, we've always had uh, we've always been faced with that, uh, but again, uh, specifically on on molars. He would like to see uh, occlusal, uh, proper occlusal anatomy, and uh, having a uh, having a, a small uh, occlusal thickness uh, table is, is very very dangerous, and that's when we see a lot of these fractures uh, occurring very very fast. Now, nesting bridges, I, I discussed that a second ago, and the reason why it's hard to nest a long span bridge in, in something like the, uh, 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 the, the prime is because nature has curves. Uh, uh, we have two curves we have to be concerned about when you're dealing with bridges, and uh, it's very difficult to accommodate uh, a naturally curved bridge, especially a very long span bridge, on um, uh, using that formulation. That uh, that you see in the prime. So, uh, how do we approach it? We approached it from the standpoint that all layers must adapt to the disk size in order to properly nest the unit. So, our incisal layer does increase as the disk increases. The dentin layer also increases. Remember, in the transitional layers, all of the layers increase proportional. To the to the size of the disc, and here we see uh, on the HTML number one we have a uniform high strength, 1,250 megapascals across the entire thickness from incisal down to gingival, and a 45% translucency, and you're able to nest those units, nest those bridges very well, because the modification of the transition layers. Uh, or it takes into account the thickness of the disc. So as we as we increase the disc size, we modify the relative proportions of the of the incisal and the gingival and the and, and, and the gingival and the transitional layers in between. And we can look at some of these things here. Here we have, here we have a two. Uh, and, and again, uh, when we moved to pre-shaded, again, you, you sort of like got stuck with whatever the manufacturer thought the, the, the shade should be, uh, which may differ a little bit. Uh, we tried to stay closer to the shade guide. And as you can see on, on the A2, the prime is a little lighter than the, than the shade guide, uh, but the HTML uh, matches the shade guide fairly well. Uh, and here, here you have the same units glaze, and here you see the bridge uh, glaze. And again, on the on the prime uh, on the uh, on the left, you're going to see a little more incisal because that's the way the disc actually is. 
And uh, these are these are like an exaggeration of what happens when you try and nest it into a into a small disk that that you normally would try and fit a a, a small uh, pontic in, um, or a small small crown in rather. Anyway. Now we recognize, uh, like a, for all on four, uh, the thickness of the bridge gets very large, and as that thickness of zirconia increases, the value comes down. So we're introducing special HTML light shades, uh, and uh, we're just introducing it at this meeting uh, for for the all on four and for for large bridges. So again, we're we're trying to accommodate uh, uh, what we know are issues in the in the uh, uh, in in your <laughs> in the prosthetic field, we try to accommodate it with new products uh, that again make, makes your job a little easier. Okay, now centering of zirconia. Now, when we center zirconia, we, we're accomplishing two things, and one of the things that not too many people talk about is the development of the shade. Uh, high temperature is needed in order to develop the color in zirconia. I mean, you know yourself, you get an A2 or, or, a, or, or a D4 disc, and they look the same on the outside before they're sintered. And the reason for that is that the color doesn't develop until the temperature gets over 1,000 degrees. And um, in, in some cases, with some formulations, we do have to be careful in over-firing the, the, the material. Uh, because with the newer zirconia blends, overfiring can sometimes result in some opacification. Okay. And the second thing, of course, we're trying to achieve full density, and that and that shrinks. And and as you know, uh, zirconia shrinks isotropically, which means that all of the all of the dimensions shrink at the same rate, independent of whether it's an abutment or or a pontic. And that's very unique to uh, zirconia. Most materials don't shrink that way. They shrink on their own center of mass. So, and during the center, during the centering process, we're developing the strength of the material and the translucency, and the shade of the material. Now, one thing about the zirconia, I, I said originally, is that it's a it's a nano material, and nano materials are very very small in size, but they carry with them a very high surface energy. In fact, if the material is able to conduct heat, uh, like for example, gold, a gold nanoparticles will actually self-assemble and they'll come together, but they'll center by themselves at room temperature. Uh, that's how high that surface energy is. And all materials that are nano have a high surface area. In the case of zirconia, we have to give it a little bit of a kick uh, because zirconia is, is, is so inert and it, it does not uh, as a very poor uh, heat conduction. Now there are there are two critical temperatures for zirconia. On heating, it's about 1,200 degrees, and that's when it transforms to the cubic phase. And then on cooling, about 950, and that's when it tries to transform to the monoclinic phase. And we always try to prevent it from going to the monoclinic phase because that's when it expands in size, and that'll that'll force a crack. So anytime you have a, for example, on glazes, we always recommend glazes below 800 in order to stay away from that 900 degree, the 900 degree mark. Uh, the higher temperature you go and cool it down, the greater the chance that it's going to transform and and crack on you. So those are the two temperatures. Now knowing those two temperatures, we could we could work with uh, uh, with how we're going to center it. And and centering uh, is basically going from about 60% dense. Uh, most zirconias uh, in the disk state is a 53 to 60 percent dense, and we want to bring it over to 100 percent dense, and that takes a certain amount of energy. And you notice we have to get rid of all this air in there, and that's critical uh, because this is a crystalline ceramic. You see, there has has grains and and grain boundaries; those, those little lines in between the grains, and the air has to travel through that grain boundary in order to exit the uh, uh, the material. If we trap it, then, then we can run into some problems. So every material has a master centering curve, and this is the master centering curve for zirconia. There we go, okay. 
very strange things are happening today. I don't know why. <laughs> Every now and then it clicks off. Okay. Um, the, uh, the master sitting curve for zirconia, what, what that means is that we're going from whatever relative density to uh, full density at different heating rates. And, and no matter what heating rate we, we choose, we're still going to uh, achieve that, that high density. And, uh, and, and that determines the amount of energy we need. That the time varies, but, but time is, is not, is not a, a critical factor. Now, uh, it's the activation energy that we're trying to, trying to get. If, if we're able to push that activation energy into the material, then we can center it very fast. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do technically is take that master centering curve, that's what that MSC means, and we want to separate the grain growth from the centering. And that's very important because if the grain grows too fast, as, a, as we'll see in a minute, if the grain grows too fast, it's going to leave some of those pores. Okay? And, and we need to control that. And you can see here uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, the, the little curves, the color curves, uh, there are different uh, different heating rates, and you still again you you, still, you you get to the same density with with different heating rates, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to a high density with a fast heating rate, and not affect the uh, and still get rid of all of the porosity in the material. And here's what I was talking about: if that grain boundary on the left, you see in the the square on the top. If that grain boundary moves past that, that little particle too fast, it's going to leave that air. And that little particle, that little air, is going to affect the translucency of the material. And in some cases, it will also uh, damage the strength of the material. But we're mostly focused on, on this for the translucency and the development of the shade. So by, by using this technology, we can center things pretty fast that sometimes don't go, that normally would not go very fast. Now, we're going to look at a couple of different methods. There's something called spark plasma. And what that is, is you have a, a high electrical current is passed through the material. And that will achieve full density in seconds. The problem is there's no dimensional control on it. In most cases, when they use spark plasma, they actually put it under pressure so that they could keep it from, from moving around. So it doesn't work very well for, for zirconia. Uh, the other uh, process, which is fast, which you may have heard of, we, we, a number of people tried this originally with zirconia, and that is to use microwaves. Now, it's not the same microwave that you have in your kitchen. Uh, that is that is uh, that wavelength is set for the water molecule, uh, but you can modify the wavelength in the microwave and change the uh, uh, the, the, the molecule to be that of, of zirconia. And you need a, a susceptor, which means a, it's like a tray that is very susceptible to the to the uh, uh, to the microwaves. So you're, you're indirectly heating the, uh, the zirconia. So you put the susceptor in the furnace, you turn on the microwaves, the susceptor gets hot, that transfers the heat to the zirconia, and then bingo, uh, you could, you could uh, center it. Uh, it takes minutes, but again, there's, there's no dimensional control on this one. And uh, here, the mass does matter because you're, using a, you have to, you're forced to use a susceptor. Now you see on the last two lines, you have the bridge cycle goes 11 to 4, 14 hours, and our regular cycle, uh, 4 to 5 hours. And now we have this new uh, furnace uh, called KDF Speed, and we could achieve full density in 90 to 120 minutes, depending on the uh, depending on what's in the furnace. Now the original zirconia furnaces use heating elements of molybdenum disilicide. That's on the left. And you have a large tray with the zirconia beads. The beads are necessary in order to make sure the material is allowed to shrink uh, as, as it needs to by itself. 
And you could have multiple trays in the furnace because the furnaces were originally developed to be fairly large and can handle large bridges, even standing up so that you could you could uh, ensure that the bridge is gonna, is gonna shrink properly and, and dozens of units. Uh, it's a slow heat up and also a slow cool down because in, in this case, the, these, these particular heating elements originally uh, could crack if you cooled it down too fast. And that requires a long centering cycle. So that, that requires the four hours and, and for bridges, 11 hour centering cycles. Then uh, a couple of years ago, we saw some furnaces uh, with, uh, that were introduced for, with silicon carbide heating elements. Now, the size of these furnaces came down dramatically. And the reason for that is that they wanted to center the material very fast. So you have to reduce the size of the furnace, the mass that you're heating, in order to in order to get that uh, hot in, in a in a quick in, in a quick uh, uh, in, in a short amount of time. So you have a small furnace. You use a beadless tray. The, the introduction of the beadless trays made made a big difference, and and these trays have very low frictional value between the uh, frictional force between the zirconia and the tray. Uh, so it allow again it allows the uh, uh, the zirconia to shrink, but you can't put a very large bridge in it. Um, and it's only one to seven uh, seven single units, and you get a fast heat up and a fast cool down. Uh, but sometimes uh, some shades may not develop properly because there's just not enough not enough heat in in the material. Uh, now now so people made these work. Uh, I remember one client that uh, told me it works fine, uh, and he, in order to get an A2, he puts an A3 in the in the furnace. So again, you know, he knows he's not getting the uh, the, the color uh, that the shade that he that he that he wants, but yet he, he found a way of getting something that that was acceptable to his clients. So we don't want to do that, really. We want to be able to. Uh, say, okay, if I, if I want an A2, I'm going to put an A2 in the furnace. If I want an A3, uh, et cetera. Okay. And this little bugger does it. Um, it's a very unusual uh, heating out. It's a very unusual furnace. It does use molybdenum disilicide, but, they're, but they're, it's, it's like the next generation of molybdenum disilicide. And it uses this tray. Uh, and I wanted to show you the tray because the tray is very unusual. And actually, the tray is almost like the secret to making this thing work. Um, they have these little discs, these little white discs, and, and you, you could put two layers in there. Uh, but there's some things about this that, that are very interesting from an engineering standpoint, and, and you need to pay attention to it in order to make it work properly in your laboratory. Number one, you cannot put the units on the darker portion. Uh, that gray is actually a graphite compound. And if you put the unit on the graphite, at high temperature it forms carbon monoxide and it may, it, it may not allow the color to form where it touches. So you wanna make sure that the units are always on that uh, ceramic disc, uh, whether it's inside or, or, or on top. And then most importantly, you have to have this spacer here. You see on, on the red arrow, you, you have to have this spacer in there, and nothing can be in there. Uh, it has to be void. And what they're doing is they're they're getting the energy into those units by 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 compressing the area that they need to heat up. So this space actually acts as an insulator, and it allows the the, the units to heat up within that area on the top, uh, rather than uh, rather than heating the whole thing. So if you're doing uh, uh, speed uh, uh, centers with these, then you could then then you have to use the graphite. If you're not going to use speed, you could you could use it as a regular furnace as well. You could use a long long cycle, but you cannot use the graphite uh, 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 trays uh, and setting formation here uh, it, for that long cycle. Again, it, it contains graphite, and the graphite is going to form carbon monoxide, and you don't want the material to be in in the in a carbon monoxide atmosphere for a very long period of time. But for a short period of time, if you do it this way, it works very well. So here we have a report of, uh, we have, in, in this case, uh, we use the uh, HC plus. 
And you see the fast fire cycle on the HG Plus is uh, 105 minutes compared to 400 and some on the uh, on the regular cycle. Now we 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 made little samples, and uh, we made two types of samples. Number one, the biaxial flexor strength, and what you're looking at here is a translucency sample. And um, uh, we're comparing the top is the regular. Uh, heat treatment cycle, 450 minutes, uh, with the fast fire cycle. So the 600 nanometer value of the of the light is what we normally consider for the translucency. So here we see a very very little difference in translucency. There's there's hardly any difference at all. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a it's a it, it, it averages out to about the about the same number. Uh, the color data. Uh, the the the, the uh, value is a little lower on the fast fire. You can see the number of 63 drops down to 62, but it's really incidental. It's really a very small incidental. So we did get a little change in U. You can see it goes from 88 to 87, which which again it, probably due to that uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, but when you put the entire uh, spectrum over it, uh, compare the two, they're they're almost right on top of each other. Um, so the translucency uh, for both samples are nearly duplicated. The translucency for the high-speed samples nearly duplicated the standard cycle uh, throughout the entire light spectrum, going from the ultraviolet to the uh, infrared. So when you look at the units itself, you can see that there's uh, hardly any noticeable difference at all between the two. And when you look at the strength, also there's, there's hardly any difference at all. Uh, the strength on the normal material is like 1250, and here on the fast fire, we're talking about 1219 or, or 1237. Still, uh, very, very, uh, very, very good. So the results of speed centering, uh, we had no significant effect on the strength of the uh, of the material. And the shade development, even though it was a short cycle, was very good. And we were able to duplicate the uh, the shade guide. Okay. Okay, we have some minutes left here. So we have a little fun. I covered it a little faster than, uh, than I wanted to, but uh, such is life. Okay, so uh, here we have our classical shade guide. And uh, you see all the uh, 19 shades. And there's a dominant color here. Uh, okay. There's a dominant color here. And I want you to tell me what color you see. Um, somebody could put something in chat for uh, what color you see. Bum, bum, bum. Well, I would think most of you have seen yellow. And, and if you think you're seeing yellow, you're, you're, you're wrong um, because you're humans and humans can't see yellow. Um, this guy can see yellow. Uh, our mantis shrimp friend. All right, mantis shrimp are very unique uh, 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 creatures. They have uh, hyperspectra color. And uh, you see on the lower right, uh, all their receptors. And it goes from uh, ultraviolet and uh, actually uh, polarized light uh, to uh, purple and then blue and then green. And there's yellow, there's yellow. And then and orange and then, and then, then red. And into, into the infrared. Now, on the left, on the lower left, you see our uh, our photoreceptors, and we only have three. So we have a blue, we have a green, and we have a red. No yellow. How do we see yellow? How, how do we perceive yellow? Well, that's just it. We perceive it when the red and the green receptor are firing at about the same rate. Uh, though we interpret that as yellow. So we don't see yellow directly. We actually interpret it. We need our brains to do that. 
uh, the uh, mantis shrimp doesn't have much of a brain. They, they, they operate by, uh, uh, by pure instinct, so they need a lot of uh, receptors. Now, why they have 12 receptors, no one really knows, uh, but whatever. Um, uh, they have a yellow receptor. We don't have a yellow receptor. Now, what's most interesting about this is that most people have these three receptors, uh, but about 10% of the men uh, do not. 10% uh, of men uh, can only see uh, are red, green, blind. Uh, so they, they only have two receptors, so they're, they're bichromatic, and um, uh, they can't distinguish between red and green. Women, on the other hand, about 8% of the women are trichromatic, are, 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 are quadchromatic, uh, tetra, yeah, yeah, quad, quad, uh, quadchromatic. They have four receptors. So um, generally, uh, a, a female's of color acuity is going to be much greater than a man's color acuity, which relates to uh, when you get your shade taken. And this also explains why uh, some doctors don't think your A2 is an A2, um, because in that in the Vita color uh, uh, classic shade guide, uh, yellow is is the dominant U. Uh, and if they don't, if they're red green blind, they're not necessarily going to see yellow uh, the same way you do. And um, here we have a little test. Um, so some of you can't see all these numbers. Uh, uh, well, except the women, the women can, can see well. Them, uh, the, the the problem with the uh, uh, the genetic defect that uh, causes the red green blindness is on the Y chromosome. So women don't have a Y chromosome, uh, so they don't have to worry about it. Uh, so we have uh, seven, six, twenty-six, six, forty-five, and sixteen. Uh, if you didn't see all the numbers, you you may want to have someone else do the uh, shade evaluation for you. Okay, so we talked about the science behind multilayer zirconia uh, very fast, and uh, we compared uh, multilayer zirconia brands, and then we talked about the science behind speed sintering, and uh, in particular, uh, one particular furnace which uh, which uh, uh, happens to uh, be very good at uh, speed sintering zirconia. Okay, so thank you very much.